Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Welcome to Online Worship with Conyers Presbyterian Church, Presbyterian Church of the Resurrection, and Smyrna Presbyterian Church. My name is Kevin Hicks. I'm pastor of Conyers Presbyterian Church. My name is David Pierce, and I'm the pastor at Smyrna Presbyterian Church. I'm Greg McMinn. I'm pastor at Presbyterian Church of the Resurrection. I'm Will Schmidt, and uh, I'm a minister of music at uh, Smyrna Presbyterian Church, and my wife, Pat, is our piano player. She'll be accompanying us this morning. Good morning. I'm Tully Fletcher, and I am the associate pastor for all three churches that have been mentioned already. And I just wanted to welcome everyone to this Palm Sunday uh, as we get ready for worship. Uh, you know, Palm Sunday is one of the most pivotal times in the life of the church. And it is really just a, a pivotal time in Jesus' ministry as well. It marks kind of the last hurrah as he and the disciples make their way into Jerusalem and ultimately to uh, Jesus dying on the cross and being in the tomb. Um, usually we mark this day in the church with children enthusiastically waving their palm branches, uh, running up and down the church aisle. Um, for those of you at home who have made your palm branches, we encourage you to wave them enthusiastically during our opening hymn. Uh, and of course, you shout Hosanna as you do that. Uh, and Hosanna quite literally means save us, which is a very appropriate message to be shouting at this unique time in our lives. Will you join with me in prayer? Oh God, we praise you. We praise you for the redemption that you have won for us through death on the cross. We praise you for the people who shouted Hosanna as you entered into Jerusalem. Let these branches be signs of your victory over death. And may we follow you in the way of the cross and that dying and rising with you, we may enter into your kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we claim we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Please join me in the prayer of confession found in your bulletin. Let us pray. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Lord, hear our prayer. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I want to invite you to uh, turn to whoever you're with at home and, and share the peace of Christ with them. Just turn to them and, and touch them on the shoulder, hold their hand, 
whatever you'd like to do and say, uh, peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Oh, I guess I ought to tell you, this sermon is brought to you by sloths, sloths and sloth blankets comforting my wife for the last three or four years now. I'm guessing most of you had not planned on giving up quite as much stuff as you've had to for Lent this year. One of the first few days I was under self-quarantine, I asked my wife if she would toast me a bagel and I didn't want to handle the bag that the bagels were in or the cream cheese container or anything like that. So she said, sure, she would toast me a bagel, but she looked at me very apologetically and she said, we're out of pineapple cream cheese. All we have is plain. And I told her that would be just fine. I understand that during a global pandemic, I don't always get pineapple cream cheese. As long as we're all healthy, as long as we're all home together, and as long as we have toilet paper, plain cream cheese will be just fine. You know, I think we're all getting a reminder of the things that are truly important and all the things that we only thought were important. We're learning that the cashiers and the people who stock the shelves at the grocery stores and Walmart and Target are far more essential than what we had previously recognized. My bucket list used to include places like Barcelona and Paris and Rome, but now my bucket list has places like Savannah and Jekyll Island and Asheville and maybe Trader Joe's. But my hope is that over this coming week, it will be the holiest of holy weeks that any of us have ever observed as we've trimmed away all of the unnecessary things from our lives and focus on what's truly essential. Our scripture reading comes from Matthew 21, beginning the first verse. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey and, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth and Galilee. This is the word of the God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Prince Gandhi once said that non-cooperation with evil is as much a duty as cooperation with good. We're told that the crowds cheer Jesus as he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But you know, we can be certain there were others who were complaining about the attention Jesus was drawing. Why did he have to make such a spectacle of himself? Why couldn't he just keep a low profile? Passover was a problem for Rome. To not allow Passover to be celebrated would invite more trouble in terms of a civil uprising. It would cost more than it was worth to stop the Jewish people from observing it. Yet the festival was a celebration of escape from Egypt, and this remembrance always seemed to be on the edges of rebellion against Rome. It's not hard to imagine all that innocent asking of questions by the children. Why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat either unleavened or leavened bread, but tonight we eat only unleavened bread. On all other nights, we eat all kinds of vegetables, but tonight we eat only bitter herbs. It's not hard to imagine that as a thinly veiled reference to events that the Jewish people hoped would one day involve an escape from Rome, and hopefully something not too far distant from the drowning of Caesar's armies, just as had happened to Pharaoh's armies centuries before. So to keep things under control, extra troops would be sent into Jerusalem 
for the duration of the celebration. They would march in from the West and they would make a great show of military might with war horses, horses and columns of marching troops entering the city in an effort to dampen the enthusiasm of any Jewish activists. The story from Rome was that it had conquered the world. Resistance was useless. In his triumphal entry to Jerusalem, Jesus appears to have carried out something between a seriously seditious piece of street theater and what we might call trolling of the powers that be. While Pilate and Herod had their ring of steel clamping down on the city, Jesus was on the other side of the city at the Mount of Olives, significant in biblical history as the place where the Lord's feet would stand when the enemies who had come against Jerusalem were finally driven out. From Zechariah chapter 14, this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall rot while they are still on their feet. Their eyes shall rot in their sockets and their tongues shall rot in their mouths. Then all who survive of the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year by year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the festival of booths. Jesus made his own entry down the hill and over into Jerusalem, mounted on a donkey and its foal. It's not some strange circus show. It echoes the text of Zechariah 9, the triumphant king who comes in peace riding a donkey, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the crowds cheered as he entered the city. But you know, crowds can be fickle. When things are going well, the crowd gets behind the team or the celebrity or the politician or whoever it is that's in charge. When things are not going so well, then the boos come out. Crowds are at their best when they are cheering a winner. And Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey was a public relations winner. The crowd was hungry for a hero, and they witnessed and interpreted the triumphal arrival as it was cast in all the Old Testament trappings and nuances of a royal arrival to the capital city. This was a hero's welcome. This was the first century Jerusalem equivalent of a ticker tape parade or a coronation. But what we have to recognize and what we are confronted with every year as we reflect on this triumphal entry, as we reflect on the events that we will Jerusalem changes their mind and their allegiance. We remember the triumphal entry of Jesus on Palm Sunday and the crowd shouting, crucify him by Thursday evening. That is a serious reversal in public opinion. I mean, I would imagine even Charlie Sheen and Tiger Woods had to say, man, they turned on you and dropped you fast. What could Jesus have done in that short week to lose so many supporters? They went from cheering him on, seeing in him all the hopes and dreams that they have for the future of their city to asking Pilate to spare the life of a criminal instead of the life of Jesus. Maybe the key to understanding Jesus' sudden drop in the polls lies in what Jesus does when he gets inside Jerusalem. He goes and overthrows the tables of the money changers in the temple. Now it's important to understand what that was all about. People would travel from near and far, and some from very, very far away, to worship and present offerings and sacrifices in the temple. For those who traveled a long distance, it made more sense to purchase the animals needed for sacrifice at the temple rather than to try and travel with those animals. However, Roman money was not accepted in the temple. The people had to exchange their money for temple money and then they could use the temple money to buy what they needed to offer their sacrifice. And the exchange rate was whatever the money changers said that it was. So imagine traveling a long distance. You're, you're going to the temple to offer a sacrifice for the forgiveness of your sins. And you arrive at the temple only to discover that it's going to cost you far more than you thought it was going to cost to buy whatever kind of animal or sacrifice you needed to make. 
you're not gonna just turn around and go home. You are at the will of the money changers. You have to, uh, the exchange rate is whatever they say it's going to be. And the buying and selling of sacrificial animals and the currency exchange was a large part of what made Jerusalem work economically. And Jesus came into town and challenged all of that. The arrival of Jesus in Jerusalem turned out not to be the coronation of a favorite son who would come into town and endorse the status quo and conform to the agenda that had been formulated by the stakeholders, but rather emerged to be the arrival of a table-turning radical who had justice at his core. Once that realization dawned, assassination and not worship became the new agenda. A Jesus who refuses to be an insider, but who always sides with the outsider, will always upset our carefully laid economic tables and status quo scenarios. You know, I hate to admit it, but at times I understand the fickle crowd. I feel the vacillation in my own heart the real radical Jesus from time to time challenges the way we think the world ought to work or the way we want the world to work. It's in those times with Jesus upturning our values and our attitudes that we need to keep in mind the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as he shared a biblical quote but then added to it. Dr. King said, the truth will set you free, but first, it will make you very angry. We're living in a strange new world right now. A lot of folks are nervous about what the future will hold. How long can we go without going to work? How long can we shelter in place before the economy reaches a point from which it cannot bounce back? Just within the last few days, there have been threats made against the doctor who has been telling people this is going to last a bit longer than just a few weeks. People are getting restless. Some people are getting angry. Now, I don't have all the answers, but I do know we need to listen to the doctors on this one. And I know we have to keep reaching out to one another as the body of Christ, staying connected with one another, even as we are apart. So we know we truly are in this together. This coming week, has the potential to be the most holy, holy week we have ever experienced. It will indeed be holy if we remember that God did not enter our lives to help us get done what we want done, to fulfill our agenda and our desires, but rather God has come to call us back to do God's work. It will be holy when something takes place that disturbs the normal commerce of our daily lives but we are able to pivot and respond in a way that focuses on justice for all of God's children. It will be holy when the spirit of God challenges the way our faith has entered into partnership with our pocketbook and our religion into the service of our communal interest. The people welcomed Jesus because they expected him to do what they wanted him to do but instead he called the city to repentance. Whenever our lives are disturbed in that way, friends, Palm Sunday happens. The triumphal entry happens. Friends, during this coming week, focus only on those things that truly matter. Your family, your friends, your health, your basic human needs and let God guide you as we all travel towards Jerusalem. Amen. Let's sing together. The company of angels is praising you on high, and we with all in chorus make reply the people of the Hebrews with palms before you wet for praise and prayer and anthems before 
for you. Let us all say together what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Will you join with me in prayer? O oh Lord, the world has changed. The streets seem like a scene from a movie, and we find ourselves filled with a mix of emotions. Sadness, frustration, anger, confusion, maybe even gratitude or love. But all of these are perhaps eclipsed by the surprise and the shock of the reality in which we find ourselves. The world has changed, Lord. And as we enter into the week before Easter, the time when we remember Jesus' betrayal, Jesus' arrest, and his execution, oh God, let us not forget your power to change the world. In this time of fear and doubt and confusion, let us be ever more faithful. Let us be your agents of love, especially to those who are on the front lines of this pandemic. Let us see through the headlines to those that the news and the world overlook. Let us not be like the fickle crowd who cheers you in times of plenty and turns away in times of despair, Lord, but let us cling to you now more tightly than ever before. The world has changed as it does every day as the sun rises and sets. The world has changed as it does every season as winter turns to spring and spring turns to summer. And the world has changed as it does every year we go round the sun. So God, we seek to partner with you in that change, to remake the world as you would have it be. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, and we pray together the prayer that Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come to that time in our service when we usually have an offering. Our offering can't be as it usually is because we're not together, but we can have an offering today. We can talk about ways in which we need to be generous, generous in our churches who are in, in a lot of need these days because they're not meeting together. People may be forgetting to give their tithes and offerings. So we encourage them to push the button on the web pages and to drop the check in the mail so that these churches' ministries can go on. And Lord, we pray that also that we might offer ourselves to care about one another. And Lord, we offer ourselves too as we serve the world by praying for people everywhere and praying for the local communities in which we live. And we offer our prayers to you too, Lord. And Lord, we uh, 
offer our prayers for all those that are doing these things. And uh, when we offer our prayers to those folks who are working with the sick and those folks who are sick. And so offer all these things up as a token of your love for God and for people. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you have blessed us so much with so many good things. And the way what's happened is that those things in some ways have been stripped away until we find out what we really are and what we really have. And so Lord, we ask you to help us to give generously, that you'd help us to pray a lot, that you'd help us, Lord, to call for healing for our world. And we thank you for the offering that we're able to present today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together. To you before your passion, they sang their hymns of praise. To you now high exalted, our melody we raise. As you receive their praises, accept the prayers we bring. For you delight in goodness, O oh good and gracious King. Now, friends, let us set aside our palm branches to go and serve at God's side in a broken and fearful world. Now let us pick up our cloaks and follow Jesus wherever he leads, to learn from those the world ignores, to be touched by the grace within them. And now let us sing songs of wonder as we work alongside the Holy Spirit, sustaining the weary with peace and with hope. And now friends, go in peace and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.